So, uh, Lars um, introduced the project in the beginning. Uh, so, um, he already said that what we try to do is build a framework for comparing, for comparing cities, a theoretical and methodological framework. Uh, so, the point is not just to um, study and analyze and understand each city individually, more that the point is through, that com through the comparison to, to analyze it, to understand, to deepen our understanding for the, spe from, for the special form of the city and especially how that relates to urban processes, to, to the life of the city, so to say. And so before we get into the models and the technicalities and the methods and the data and all that, I mean, we never forget what we, it is that we study. And this is what we study. So we study the physical environment of the city, the basic components, the basic objects of special design, the streets, the plots, the buildings, and how do they relate to this, to the life of the city? How do we move? How do we experience the city? How do we organize the public life, uh, our private properties, and all that? So this is what we study. And these are the basic elements of our model. And I use the term model here, as Lars put it in the beginning. Um, so the basic components of the physical form of the city, the streets, the plots, the buildings, and then we add the address points, where is the smallest location point that is also very important. So what we do is that we um, build a GIS model, so interlinked GIS layers of these different components. Uh, and we add, like I said, the layer of the address points. The interlinking of this is very important for us because then you, we, you, can only, uh, you cannot only uh, study and analyze each layer and each component individually, but also study their combined effect. So how do these together shape the form of the city and affect the life of the city? And of course, since we talk for, uh, about the GIS model, and I mean, this is obvious for people working with that, is that it comes all these geometric features that, uh, compound, uh, that compile a layer come with loads of data. So they are connected to attributes, to properties. So each of these address points, each of these buildings, each of these plots, each of these streets, they're not only geometric features that are mapped, but they come with a large set of information. And also this information are linked. So to put it simply, each address point is linked to each particular building that it belongs and then to the plot that it belongs and to the street that it belongs. And vice versa, each street has, the, has an amount of plots, more buildings and more address points. So we go from the least aggregated element to the most aggregated element and vice versa. But also these geometric features, like I said, come with a large set of information. And this information are also linked. So we can link information on the building, for example, uh, the height or the age of construction, to the plots, the streets, and so on. So all this information are linked. So in the end, let's say we have, this is an example in part of Amsterdam. So we have these geometric layers of description that, like I said, are interlinked. Uh, as you see, uh, the street network is uh, split in two layers. So it's the motorized network and the non-motorized network. And that simply is that the, the motorized network excludes, is basically what is, uh, uh, how do you say, available for the, from the official sources. So it's basically the vehicular roads that are uh, consistently mapped by official uh, uh, authorities. Uh, but we also put together uh, a network of non, the non-motorized network, which also includes the pedestrian path, so, um, paths, so paths and streets that are only accessible to pedestrians. And then uh, we excluded, uh, for example, highways, so roads that are completely inaccessible to pedestrians. So these two networks, especially in cities, in Swedish cities, for example, like Gothenburg or Swedish or, uh, or Stockholm, are 
complementary, yes, but also very, very different. And especially in some areas, like modernistic estates and so on, these networks are not at all, um, uh, how do you say, they, they are they're not at all the same. So uh, then the non-motorized network takes over in a way. Uh, like I said, not only these layers are interlinked through a, a series of IDs and um, methods, and anyway, I will not go into that detail, but also all of the layers, and especially the address point layer, is connected to data sets of uh, other uh, kind of socioeconomic data, for example. So information like residential population, uh, land price, house price, um, um, uh, and so on, are all linked to the address point layer. And that brings us to the basic principles of the model, that not only it links these layers of description so that we can have combined uh, analysis of those components and understand better how these together shape the form of the city, but also that we bring in the analysis from the beginning by putting all this socioeconomic data in the, into our layers of description. We bring this kind of data into the analysis from the beginning. So then we can make more elaborate descriptions and more uh, deep analysis in a way on how spatial form relates to urban processes, how spatial variables relate to, to socioeconomic variables and how these together shape the life uh, of the city and how then we can understand the relation between spatial form and urban processes better, not after the analysis but in the analysis from the beginning. And then, uh, for, this is an example that uh, f for how these um, different uh, uh, variables are integrated in the, the address point layer. For example, residential population or activities and so on. So we, you can have the same layer uh, with different representations. And also then you can understand the special patterns and the distribution of these uh, uh, other variables. Another. Uh, <coughs> But when you, when you start doing that, so when you start linking external data sets and other kind of data, of course you can understand the possibilities of that because then you can add uh, different, kinds, uh, different kinds of data. So this is, I mean, is never ending in a way. So, and of course you can add to the model different uh, layers in the future. So one of, of the basic principles was open that was also that the, this would be open. So a model that you could, we could in the future add other layers and then we have the techniques and methods to link them. And because we said we built an infrastructure and a framework that also has to be open for future extensions. And I will talk about that in the, in the end a little bit more. But we can have examples, for example, that we have, uh, that we would uh, like to add a layer of public transportation, or for example, that the plots then could be added to data that, to, to a layer of biotopes, uh, or the information on the buildings uh, could be added, and so on. So this is an open model. So we have the base now, and then it's easier for us then to add more layers and more data. And that gives us a high amount of flexibility uh, to do different kinds of analysis, combined analysis, but also to represent results on different levels that will produce more informative uh, visualization. And also, because we use visualizations to understand things, to highlight things that are not uh, understandable just by looking at a map. So every time we represent, every time we visualize, we do that with a purpose, and we do that to, uh, to answer a question, to highlight a problem. So you can, for example, visualize build density, accessible FSI here, on the building level, on the street level, or on the address level. We have the flexibility to do that. That allows us to make informative visualization to answer to highlight a specific topic. So flexibility was another thing that we had as a name. Resolution or detailing, that is another thing. So because we're talking about very big, uh, so the very big cities and I mean the coverage of our model is, is, uh, is, very, is very large also. I will show you the areas uh, later on. But the idea is and the purpose was that 
the detailing and the resolution of these uh, geometric layers would be that it could also both facilitate large-scale analysis, so highlight the global structure, so you need to have a kind of a generalized model to do that, but also to have the detail and the, uh, and the um, precision in a way that will allow us to also go on the details and that would allow us to connect what we see here with the observations on site. So you can't do that. I mean, you can't really relate to what is happening on the ground if, you, for example, you want to do a pedestrian survey or a pede or to, to, um, to observe how pedestrians move if you don't have a network that is detailed enough to support this. So the resolution of the detail to hold both large-scale analysis and detailed analysis. And this is quite difficult to do when you have these huge data sets. The context, another thing that for us is obvious, but, it's, but it is something that we, are, we always have to um, remember, is that our study area is something that we define, but the analysis set, we have to analyze the study area in a greater context in, if we want to really take into account the, the contextual effects, let's say, uh, in our study area. So just to show you a little bit the, what, what is the coverage of this, this is our study area. So. In London, for example, in, in square kilometers, sorry, I didn't put that. Uh, you see the numbers, the study area, for example, in London is 3,400 square kilometers, but the analysis area is 10,000 square kilometers. So it's 25 kilometers at least larger in all sites, the analysis area. So that to make sure that our analysis of the study area has taken into account the effects of the context. This is a very important principle, and uh, is that it's the fact that when you when you build a model the way that we define it, this is not neutral. So we make decisions of how to make that, and those decisions are based not only on the aims, but most of all of the representations of space that we want to to achieve in a way. And those come from the methodology, the theoretical framework that Lars. Um, presented in the beginning, and he will do that later on. So, I mean, uh, the, how we represent the street network, for example, is a, has a lot to do, comes from the tradition of space syntax. How we, what in kind of information we need on the building layer comes from what we want to, uh, to analyze and to measure, then uh, that comes from the work of Meta Berkhauser Pond and Perot uh, with the space matrix, and so on. So this is not a neutral model. This is we edited the layers of description to be able to do this kind of analysis and to measure uh, specific, to make specific special analysis of this kind of layers. So this is very important that the model has to facilitate uh, and represent space as we want it based on a theoretical uh, um, uh, framework and background. Uh, the, maybe the hardest aim to achieve uh, was the comparativity. So, of course, when you want to compare cities, this is a big challenge. How do you make the layers, how do you make the models comparati comparable? Uh, and, th th and that requires a high amount of editing and working with the data sets and the maps that we got from different sources. Um, so this is, I mean, this is a basic challenge. How do we make these that are comparable in, in, in cities of so different in size, not least? So you, how do you put on the same image even as Kilstuna in London? I mean, that's, uh, that's something. How, do, how can you say anything about these two together? But you can. And this, uh, the, the last principle, in a way, so the comparativity, um, that, that brought uh, the most implications, the, 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 the hardest challenges, in a way. Because, uh, and starting now to co even to compare cities, even from this stage, 
uh, what happened is that, of course, you get a lot of data, a lot of maps, a lot of data sets from different sources. And then what happens is that, of course, every country has different standards uh, of how they map things and how they classify data, how they structure data. So all of these official authorities in different countries have different standards for the input data. So we need to make this, um, to, to bring this, this in the same level of detail, in the same structure, and have the same classes of data, and the same structure of data. And for example, we could not even find the same um, layers of description in all countries. Um, the plot layer, the property layer, as we find it here in Sweden, for example, in, in London, does not exist. So there was a ki another kind of mapping of the building polygon and the courtyard, for example, but not what we call the layer of the plot. So in, in a way, we, we needed to make that. But also inside, the, the, in, inside let's say, in, in the data we got from Sweden for a, for a, from official sources, of course there are inconsistencies. We are talking about big data. Of course there are likings. Of course there are errors. So all of this had to be taken into consideration. And, and high amount of editing was related to how do you make this in a way that it is comparable and also that it is detailed enough to be used in the analysis and to have valid results. Another example is uh, f that throughout the cities, uh, the mapping of pedestrian paths was, I mean, hugely lacking. So even it, either it was not there as a layer, or it was um, highly uh, incomplete. So only London had an official mapping of pedestrian paths. Of course, it is incomplete even then. But that is something to say about the like the official uh, motivation or drive or um, um, to, to map, to start mapping, officially mapping also the pedestrian paths, because that has been going on for a lot of years, uh, the mapping of the vehicular roads. But the pedestrian paths are not fully mapped. And again, especially for countries like Sweden, this is very important to do. So a high amount of editing was uh, required to achieve comparability, to adapt to the specific method of uh, special analysis, and to link the different layers of special description. And of course, you see the numbers, the upper right corner. I mean, how many records did we have only in our study area? Imagine the analysis area, which was so much larger, uh, that these, these uh, procedures had, of course, to be automatized uh, and to be fully documented and to be reproducible in the future. So everything was uh, done. Um, we set up automatized procedures in a way, and we, we fully documented that. So if everybody, so that everybody knows how we did it, and also somebody else can do it the same way. I mean, in the hopes that we could we could add. Um, uh, other layers or other models or other cities in the future. Yes, these are the official sources. Um, I will not spend more time on that. Uh, a big challenge was how was the size, the different size of the city. So this is the first question that somebody asked. How do you deal with that? I mean, how do you compare? Uh, and of course, with uh, and that brings about the question of what is the boundary of the city. I mean, how do we define now the contemporary city? And of course, it's not the administrative boundary, because the cities have grown over that a long time ago. Uh, and, and of course, we want to take into account the sprawl of the city and the development of the city outside the administrative borders. And what we used as a base and as a reference is the urban morphological zones, and that is used by the EU and the Eurostat as a boundary to define the urbanized areas, uh, because they also want to compare cities and compare, let's say, socioeconomic data, for example, uh, unemployment rates, uh, population rates, um, um, rates, and so on. And this, also, they need a kind of a boundary definition so that they can compare European cities. So, I mean, we were not the first people to have this kind of problem. So we use their boundaries, what they call urban morphological zones, which is the urbanized area. And you see in London, this, we have this really curly uh, 
boundary, but then we took a convex hull, as you see with the dotted line, because we wanted to include also these open areas that as we find, especially in the Swedish cities, um, large parks like kind of reserved areas, forest areas, hills and all that, that are integral part of the city. So you cannot exclude that in a way, especially in Gothenburg, you have this experience here, Stockholm, for example, that are, these are parts of the city. So this is what we used. So this is our study area. And if we start with that and we just, now we have, the, let's say, the models, and then before we apply any kind of special analysis, just by looking at this, you can say something about the cities. Just with simple numbers and simple calculations, you can start comparing, say, oh, without any advanced special analysis. For example, here you see the networks of the, in the urban, in the central parts in a way, of the, of the cities. And then if we say, let's say that we had a circle of 500, uh, kilomet uh, of 500 meters, how much street length do we find in each city? So what is the street density in a way? Uh, you see the number, so you see, I mean, in the same circle, let's say, the number in, in London, you have 14 kilometers almost. And uh, in Amsterdam, 12. And then in uh, Gothenburg, you have eight. So in the same circle, let's say, you have a more dense network in, the, in London, for instance, or not so dense uh, in Gothenburg. And this is a, this is a motorized network. So uh, it is a base, the, base, uh, the basic uh, uh, street network. But let's say a more interesting question for us is not this, but let's say that you, want to, you are in a street and you want to see how much street length can you reach if you walk 500 meters. So this network reads. This is what it is accessible to walk or to drive in this, uh, in this uh, um, point here. So again, you see that now Amsterdam has uh, the highest network reach. So the network that is available in a way is more accessible in this case. So Amsterdam has uh, not so much street length there built, but uh, more of it is accessible. So things like that. And you see also that the Swedish cities have a lower number on that. But like I said, if we add the pedestrian network to that, which is complementary, so this change, so you see that in Gothenburg, for example, I think that is something also we experience every day, is that you have a richer uh, network of pedestrian roads. So uh, you have a very rich network that the pedestrians can access. So in this case, if we see uh, the network rich in the non-motorized network, then you see that Gothenburg goes very high like London, again, Amsterdam consistently has higher numbers in accessibility and reach of the network. But you see how these things change and need to be taken into account, but also uh, very simple comparisons between cities that can be made even at this stage to start to understand what we're dealing with. Yes. Or if we go into the buildings and the plots, and we, have, we start to, to look at the numbers, very, very simple, very, very simple uh, calculations. For example, again, we see interesting differences and consistently that the Swedish cities match in a way and they are quite different from the other two. And that not, that's not to say that the other two are very similar, it's just that the Swedish cities are very similar. So if you see the foot, mean footprint of the building or the mean gross floor area, you see that London has the um, finer grain of buildings. So smaller buildings and smaller uh, footprints, and that goes with smaller plots as well, than the Swedish cities. So they have overall bigger, larger plots and then um, uh, larger buildings. And of course, that is related to the fact that London had a more a higher network density because I mean the street network and the plots and the grain of the buildings and all that, these are all interrelated. 
So, uh, so we see we see uh, interesting differences either even in that stage, and also not only in the inner city areas, but also if you go into the outskirts, you see the bigger plots in Sweden, for example, that you have um, uh, these areas of these large villa areas, and also that includes some parts of uh, forest-like open areas, so larger plots. So, of course, the, this 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 model is applied now is used in a way in the um, International Spatial Morphology Lab as the main the base of the all the spatial analysis, with the aim, like we said, to relate to urban processes, but also to derive to contemporary typologies in a way of special form typologies that characterize the uh, co contemporary cities. But also, there are already uh, new applications and extensions. Uh, that, and of course, there are some future steps that we are thinking of. And these are related to what you we will hear in the afternoon. But uh, let's say we already a, a name. So how to, to, to use that? Now we, we made that. And of course, it can be extended to add more cities, to add more layers, to add more data. Uh, but I mean, how can also how can we use it also? Uh, so there are two running projects at this point, uh, and one is called Urban Calculator, and then we we will use that to develop tools. We say that transfer knowledge from research to practice. So I think we will hear more about that in the afternoon. Um, but uh, this is th th this model uh, first of Gothenburg will be used. Uh, as a base to build that tool. And uh, of course, something else that we add, and this is also a running project, is that we add longitudinal data. So again, as a base, we have Gothenburg. So we, we try to add uh, time data and to build to see how, this, uh, how the, um, the city of Gothenburg uh, developed through the years, so from 1960 to now. This is our two running projects, but of course the 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 aim is to add more to to expand, like we said, the modeling to to ways. So to add more data, or to add more layers of description, but also to add more cities. So to have more comparative examples, and not least, that doesn't have to be only European cities. I mean, you can look outside of Europe. <laughs> 